Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast, episode 712. From the sleepy suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio, there are assembled the world's two greatest podcast hosts, created from the cosmic legends of the universe. Sean Whalen. Welcome to Raging Bullets, a DC Comics fan podcast. I'm a big fan of varying colors. My love for Batman is that stuff. Let's talk some comics. And Jim Seculin. How's it going, eh? You know me and Superman. I'm really loving what they're doing. Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. Their mission? To discuss DC comics in books, movies, and television several times a month in one to three hour episodes. And to serve all mankind. Outstanding. Welcome to Raging Bullets. I'm Sean Whelan, Dr. Norge, and I'm joined as always by my co-host Jim, the sensei of the whatnot, Segulin. How's it going, eh? Jim, on this episode, we're going to be talking about Batman Gargoyle of Gotham number one. We're also going to be talking about Green Lantern War Journal issue number two as we continue taking a look at the dawn of DC. And Jim, welcome back to the show. I know we've had a little bit of a short hiatus. I've been kind of vague on what that was because it's kind of your story to tell. So you want to tell our listeners kind of why we had to take a little bit of a short break in there and um, fill yeah, everyone in. Uh, yeah, well, dad, my dad was in the hospital, um, is the, the quick version of it. Dad's had a heart history, you know, that some of you guys know, so I've talked about a little bit. So he was, he, he started having an episode. And my sister got him to the hospital, you know, through the because he happened to be in the car with my sister when they were coming back from his one doctor, you know, and she drove him right to the emergency room, got him into the emergency room. And, um, he now has a internal pacemaker and defibrillator in his body. And he's right now at a, uh, rehab, uh, facility, uh, you know, rehabbing from the, uh, from the surgery. So he's, he's out of the hospital, the doctors have said heart function's already improved since it's been implanted. And dad's dad, he's in great spirits and he's doing awesome. And it was funny because he even told me, he's like, hey, go go and record. Say hi to Sean. You know, I'm okay. So after we're done recording, I'm going to run over to the uh, run over to the rehab facility and just hang out with him. We're going to watch the Browns game and just, you know, just generally chill. That's what mostly Mary and I have been doing. Uh, my brother Bill was just in town, and he came and visited Dad and spent the day hanging out with Dad. So that was kind of cool. So let's, yeah, but yeah. So that's what's going on with me. Um, I'm back to. We should be able to regular recording you now. As long, you know, because again, as I said, Dad's doing better you now, so he's getting stronger, and eventually he'll be back home, which we're hoping for. But right now, he's just got to get his strength back um, and get everything healed up because you know he's. He's less than a week since the surgery, so he's still he's still in the healing phase, but he's he's doing good. Yeah, and I would say for anybody listening out there, just always check the website. Um, I, I will always update the website with the status of the podcast and when we're releasing. Um, as Jim said, we're gonna get, it looks like we're gonna get back to regular recording right now, but obviously your dad's health comes first, so we will obviously bob and weave and adjust accordingly. Um, we are sponsored, as always, this episode by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Jim, what's going on over at DCBService.com? Neil before Zod. 12-issue series, issue number one about General Zod, 50% off, two forty nine. dollars Well, what else is 50% off? Night Terror's hardcover, 50%, $14.99. Night Terror's Dark Nightmares hardcover, 50%, $19.99. And Night Terror's... Uh, Nightmares League, 50% off, nineteen ninety nine. Thank you. Thank you, DCBS. Over at InStockTrades.com, they have their deals of the week. They have Batman 3 Jokers trade paperback, nineteen ninety nine regularly, 50% off, only nine ninety nine. Teen Titans Go box set number two, The Hungry Games, twenty nine ninety nine regularly, 50% off, only fourteen ninety nine. I want to thank DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. Mr. Seglin, what kind of a podcast are we? Because people need to know. Raging Bullets is a spoiler podcast. We go in-depth into plot lines, story twists, and whatnot of the comics we're discussing on today's show. So if you haven't read the books, you may want to come back later so you can better enjoy the show. Let's talk some comics. Through the magic alchemy of nature's most awesome sources of energy, Ray Palmer, atomic physicist, becomes the Atom. (laughs) 
Jim, before we jump into our discussion real quick, there's something coming out this month that, you know, it's uh, with pre-ordering comics, a lot of times I forget what I pre-order. There's an Aquaman in the Lost Kingdom special coming out this month, a one, oversized one-shot. Um, it's it's funny how I, I'm i worried about this film because I figure, like, right now, it seems to be like the general feeling is, it, oh, it's a DC movie and move along. Um, and I think a lot of this is this tone that's out there of superheroitis. Even Scorsese, you know, is on the bandwagon again of we've got to go after the superhero movies. And it's a weird time to do that with theaters. And I'm a big film fan, so take comics out of it and film in general. And I just was, you know, baffled by any thought process that's like anti any film right now because movie theaters are hurting. So what I want to what I want to see is on any week two or three films that are doing really well. <laughs> yeah. Not just one ten- we're at this period now where it seems like there's one giant tentpole movie and nothing else can topple it. And that's not healthy for movie theaters. Um, not multiplexes. If you like variety, if you like choice Go to the theaters, if you like being at theaters, I'm just saying that, and see movies that you like to see at the theaters. I'm not telling people, like, don't, like, go overdo it and go crazy movies that you don't want to see and that type of thing, but certainly support the films that you want on the big screen, because these dollars count right now. Um, It's sending a message, you're voting basically with your dollars, of, on what you want to see in the movie theaters. Because this is changing. It's a changing market right now. That's not alarmist. It's just a reality. Uh, I think what what theaters are going to look like in the next five years is going to gradually be drastically different. Unless something changes quickly. And I don't think it's going to. I think we're morphing right now. And this morph is going to lead to some final version of it. We're seeing theaters close in record numbers. Um, if you like your local theater, support it. Um, support it with movies that you want to see. And that, that this is the time to vote, you know, with your dollars. And vote on the things that you really want to be there with. Encourage your friends to go see movies that they want to see in the theater. Um, so that way it's supporting the box office with the types of films you want to see there. Because uh, they're paying attention right now. I, I think we're, we're, we're in an era where we're going to see certain films are just not going to make it to the theater. I think certain films are going to make it to streaming products. And, and not have a theatrical release. But I think that it's just an interesting sort of time. Um, I'm worried for the multiplex. But where what led me to this was there's a special coming out for Aquaman of the Lost Kingdom. I If it wasn't for this advertisement in the comic, I completely forgot that I pre-ordered this bad boy. But I'm excited for it. I'm excited for this film. I've been a big fan of the Aquaman movie, the first one. I'm excited for the second one. I think this one has got two things working against it right now. Uh, number one is the Amber Heard, Johnny Depp thing. Because I think now Amber Heard and the controversy around Amber Heard has become more prevalent than the film itself. Like now now there's talks about Jason Momoa being drunk on the set and, and coming in and dressing like Johnny Depp to intimidate her. I, I don't know the truth of any of that. You know, I mean, I'm I'm against bullying and all that kind of thing. So if that really happened, I'm against it. I don't know. Um, it just seems like there's one thing after another going after a DC movie. Um, where I get worried about that is, even if there is some controversy relating to this, films are made by a lot of people. There's a lot of people. You, when you look at the credits, that's a lot of people being employed by that film. So not supporting a film hurts all of those people because that's future jobs it's not just the actors that are on screen it's all of those people behind the scenes Um, if this market isn't available to them where do you go you know i mean the the more limited the output because streaming services are not making money right now um they're they're scrambling to try and find ways to become profitable and i know for myself one of the things i'm reevaluating is how many of my streaming services i'm keeping before, I had like things bundled together and they were at a pretty good cost. But as these streaming services are increasing, I'm starting to pick and choose which ones I stick with because what I'm finding is it's like any streaming services are becoming like my new comic book stockpile <laughs> where yeah. I've got like four of them right now and I'm watching two. I keep the other two because I want to get to the content on them, but 
I just don't get to them. So I used to do like the yearly thing to save money, you know, where I'd buy a year's worth of the streaming service. Now I'm not. I'm going to start going a la carte, going monthly, not because of any other reason other than they're getting costly. And that's going to be a thing. So I'm. It, it's an interesting state for media right now when you've got exclusive media only going to certain locations. Um, movie theaters are getting hurt. Um, I think the strikes, and by the way, that's not. this is not anti-striking, this is not anti-standing up for what you believe in, it's just the strikes came, unfortunately, at a time where theaters were already hurting. Now we're going to have a gap in content at a time where theaters cannot afford a gap in content. I'm just worried for films like this that have already got strikes against it before it's even been released. Because I'm not hearing anybody talk about this. And what I mean is, like, you and I are talking about it. You and I want to see it. Anybody listening to this, it's on your radar, I'm sure. But I'm willing to bet if we surveyed our audience, the interest is all over the place. Like, I think some of our audience members are probably highly interested in this film, like we are. Some of them are falling in the middle. And actually, some of our DC audience, people that listen to this because they're DC fans, are kind of like, I don't know, I'm kind of over it. And I, that's a sad place for a film like this to be in because I think it's going to be pretty good because the first one was fantastic. It, it is funny because you, you say about people' interest and whatnot. I've got uh, one of my well, I've got a couple people at work who are comic book movie fans. They don't read comics, mm -hmm. but they watch the movies. They've seen all the movies. They've seen the TV shows, the animated stuff, and whatnot. The whole the whole deal there. They just don't buy comics. And the one is a Jason Momoa fan on top of being a comic book movie fan. Sweet. So I'm expect, I was, I've am was. i been expecting to hear from her for a long time, and I haven't heard anything from her. So I reached out to her like, hey, you know, he's like, oh, that's still happening? Oh, I thought that got scrapped. Yep. She actually thought the movie got scrapped. And as I said, she's not just a comic book movie fan. She's a Jason Momoa fan, and she thought the movie got scrapped. She heard about the the whole Lobo rumors, and she she and I had a cool conversation about who Lobo was, mm -hmm. yeah, because she really didn't know who Lobo was. I'm like, oh, he'll he'll do that part really good. You know, if that actually happens, he's the right actor for it. But it was one of those things where it was kind of interesting that she thought the movie got completely scrapped. The delays, you know what it is? Yeah. It's they. I think that the studios thought these delays would somehow, you know, like let's wait and generate more interest when people are more willing to go to the theaters. What they've done is. They did all this promotion for these movies and have delayed them and delayed them and delayed them to the point where people think it doesn't exist anymore. I think you're right. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, it, it's just a, it's a, it's a sad time. And I don't want to spend the whole show talking about this, but it's been a while since we talked about this. Um, there was an article by Scorsese, and I, I'm poorly paraphrasing it right now, but he was he's been known over time to go on rants um, going against comic book films. I, here's the way I look at it. Is not everybody's going to love comic book films. I'm a film fan. I, I happen to have very diverse film tastes. I don't love every film, but I will admit I'm, I find a wide variety of films enjoyable to varying degrees. There's other people where certain genres just are not their cup of tea. Not everybody's going to love comic book movies. That's okay. Um, but why would you root at this time? Why would you root against any genre of film? I, I just don't understand that. If you call yourself a filmmaker, why would you do that? Um, why, why wouldn't you make quality films and promote those quality films and promote films that you like? You know, like, ranting and raving article about some great movies that you'd like to see people touch on. That's a better use of time. I just don't get it. But again, it's kind of our philosophy anyway. Speaking of our philosophy, want to tell people what we're going to be talking about today? Well, uh, first up is Green Lantern War Journal, issue number two. The writer is Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Montos, uh, colors by Alex. It's G-U-I-M-A-R-A-E-S. I believe Guillaume's. I'm not sure, though. Um, letters by Dave Sharp, uh, cover by Taj Tenfold, with variant cover by Mirko Cope. C O L A K and John John Jiang, uh, 125 uh, variant by Ariel uh, Colin, 150 variant Rafael Sarmento, uh, artist spotlight variant is Gabriel Delato, assistant editor is uh, Jillian Grant and editor Paul Kaminsky. 
Dude, this is... I'm going to make a bold statement right now. My favorite John Stewart book ever. Uh, the first two issues in. Um, and, and here's the reason why. Um, and, and I love the character, so I want to be really, really clear on this. But I think what ends up happening is sometimes he is like the also on a book. You know, he's on the core book. He's on this book. And it's it's never a book that like spotlights him and really feels like it nails him. Um, this one really spotlights Jon Stewart and his family and uh, his career. And I feel like I'm getting to know Jon now. There's things that are really working for this one that I'm just really, really digging. First of all, fantastic villains, and villains plural, um, in, in the way that they're handling it. There's been a change in his status quo that is very, very interesting. Uh, the art team on this book matches the writing. Uh, it's, it is a very, very solid-looking, special-looking book. It feels very unique out there. And the you and I have talked about this in Green Lantern books before. The color work in this book is exceptional. Um, I really, really enjoy the whole presentation of this one. I don't know if you're getting the same experience I am off of this one. I am, admittedly, I'm a Hal Jordan guy. Um, Hal's, Hal's my Green Lantern guy. I really, really am loving the whole presentation of this Jon Stewart book. I am so in on this. I really, really enjoyed issue one. We were going to record on issue one. I was excited the fact that we're doing issue two because I'm like, all right, I can read more of this and and put it to the top of my stack because it is that good. It's yeah. a really good looking book. Where are you at on this one? Oh my god, come on, Jon Stewart is my lantern, mm -hmm. and literally he's he's the first. Um, Green Lantern book that I read was it was a mosaic. Mm -hmm. You know that's when I started reading. You know because it was back in college days. My buddy Hoach, you know, started lending me comics, and one of the things he lent me was you know mosaic. He's like, hey, here's a pretty cool. This is a different lantern, and you know, so I'm reading it. I absolutely love the character. And then as the com he comes out, you know, more issues on him, more stuff on him. You know, you get to learn who John Stewart is. I loved the nature of him where he is the architect, but he is also the warrior. And now we've got him, you know, he is the guardian on top of that. And you see he is the builder, you know, he's, he's the designer. And there's just all these things that this character has grown and evolved and just become, and I'm not even talking power levels. Yeah. I'm talking his own personality because of the stuff he's dealt with. You know, he's, he's got the weight of the universe on his shoulders, literally. And he's had where he's, cause the destruction of worlds, you know, you know, he's, you know, people had under his protection have died. There's things that they've done with this guy that have given him the, the character, the chance to grow. And I love that about this guy. So when the book, when, you know, first off started, uh, John uh, Stewart started, I'm like, yes, I'm in. Read the first issue. I was like, oh, oh this is going to be cool. You know, because again, it's continuing on what is going on in the Green Lantern universe. And I do love that, they didn't drop everything that happened to the core. Right. How the core, in a sense, is gone. It's not gone because now it's under different control and different ownership and this and that. And Earth is a quarantine zone. No lanterns are allowed there and whatnot. But, you know, they made the core kind of villains in this story. And I really love that because... I was always a Green Lantern core guy. I liked the stories of the core over the individuals. I liked having when they had a large ro rotating cast in there. I always thought that was cool, you know, because it's the intergalactic police force. And I like those kind of stories. So they're taking the thing that I like the most about it, throwing it out. And I'm saying, yeah, this is awesome. You know, they're, they're making the core villains and I'm loving it. Yeah. And that tells you the quality of the story being told. If they can take something that always was my lock in, always was my lynch in to this story and say, oh, no, they're not the villains. You know, and I'm doing air quotes around the term villains because I, I don't know if you can really call the core villains because they're just handling the Green Lantern core differently. So well, but that's isn't that one of the key things that make it so interesting, though? Right. It's because you have to put quotes around it. Um, I, I think you're right in the way that you're describing it as, quote, villains, because it's not as simple as that. And, and I'm with you. That's intriguing. So I think the way you're describing it is like spot on. You know, and, and again, I'm really looking forward to when they start to tell the story of, you know, you know, the rebirth of the core. 
the just the, the concept that you and I and all the Green Lantern fans know and love, they're going to eventually bring that back. Mm-hmm. We know it's going to happen. When? I don't know. Who's going to be the writer for it? I don't know. Uh, hopefully it's, you know, Philip Kennedy Johnson, because I really like their writing. <laughs> uh-huh. That would be an awesome story in the War Journal series to actually tell that part of the, the rebirth. Have Wait. John Stewart be the one to rebirth the core. I would love that. Can I, can I pause you for one second there? Here's sure. what I want to see before that. I, I'm, I'm nodding to everything you're saying, so agreeing. But you know what I want to see before that? Stories with this core. Yeah. Like, I don't feel I, I completely understand it yet. And I want to. Like, I yes. want to know, what, what is this? Like, is it as simple as everybody's toe in the line? Because there was some names thrown out there that are still on the court that, uh, what do they think about all this? You know, I, I want to see the intrigue of this thing. Like, you know, are they on board? And if they are, why? I think there's something interesting to be told there. And maybe this will be told in this book, maybe it'll be told in Hal's. I don't know where. Um, don't really care where. I just want to see the stories because they've got me hooked and, and you're, I'm with you. I'm, I'm a core guy. Um, but over the years there have been stories that have separated the green lantern from the core. I think this is the right time because there needed to be kind of a shakeup, you know, something to just bring some interest and intrigue back into these books. And Boy, they've done a really, really good job of, I think, doing a captivating story that's wanting, has me wanting everything you do, but I'm happy to go along for this ride. I want to know more about this core. Like, I, it's, they've got me interested. Tell me more. Let me see more. I'd like to see the interactions of members of the core with each other. What is that like? This, it's, it's a very, very interesting time to be a Green Lantern reader. Oh, big time, big time. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, we didn't mention earlier, we always talk about the creative team. And one of the things you talked about, and I want to echo 100%, is the look, you know, the colors, the the full, the art team, the colorist, lettering, all of that, yeah. you know, is working so well with the writing. And one of the things that does amaze me is issue one, the colorist was Adriano, Adriano Lucas. This time we've got Alex, I don't know how to pronounce the last name, sorry, but the thing that got me was the each issue, you look at them side by side, they still have that same energy. They still yeah. have that same vibe. They still have that same feel. Now, Art you know, Montos is doing all of that. Uh, Dave Sharp's doing lettering for both of it. So you see a consistency there. But that colors, the colorist in a green book, in any of the Green Lantern books, it has to pop. It has to have that energy. Both uh, colors are doing a brilliant job with that. I absolutely love the look of this book. Love how, you know, again, you know, this this is a true art you know, team working together here. And I love how they're able to have two different colorists, but still give me that same feel, still give me that same energy. You know, that's just, I don't know if that's editors doing that, if that's the artist doing that, if it's just the colorists are that good. Don't know who gets the, the, you know, the tip of the cap, but, you know, whoever it is, thank you. Thank you, thank you for giving me the, such a really consistent, beautiful book. I think set pieces are a thing that's been key to me with the artwork is this the fact that, I mean, great character designs. I want to be very, very clear about this. I love the character designs. But we're going to vast places. You know, we're going like the, we go from the Amazon rainforest to steelworks to space to different things like that. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, in this book, a lot of going to different vast locations. In those set pieces, there's multiple panels of establishing of things like vegetation and even in steelworks, you know, I mean, steelworks is this like, you know, next generation office facility. It's, you know, what what you see from like Google and Apple and stuff like that now in your bigger companies, Disney, whatever you see, you know, these big, these big lush spaces where people want to be at. Uh, I really, really loved the designs of the set pieces of the characters. This is a very artistic book. And that's always a draw with me with comics. Um, when you've got a fantastic writer who's writing just great dialogue, you need that, by the way. I want to be very, very clear. It's the marriage of both. But you, when you've got that paired with it, an art team that is really, really doing something special, it stands out for me. And the character designs, facial expressions. When he's walking into Steelworks with his mom, 
And she's looking at the place. And Mom's become a character who is very interesting to me in the book because I had um, my grandmother um, went through a memory care facility and it, it vast, you know, Alzheimer's and all of that. My wife works at a memory care facility. So we've been surrounded, you know, by a lot of people in various stages of their life going through just Alzheimer's, dementia, different things like that. His mom's going through some stuff and she's very high functioning. And, uh, you know, with the idea of wanting to keep her at home, wanting to keep her living life, wanting to keep her enjoying life for as long as he possibly can is something I just really relate to. And he's trying to juggle that in the balance with having a career because he's trying to get his career going because that's he's had some trouble with that. Um, and Steelworks is this opportunity for that. And also being sort of a Green Lantern because he's kind of set that aside for now, but can't. It's once I've gotten out, they're pulling me back in. You know, he's got that whole scenario going on right now. And it's he's juggling a lot. And mom is mom is sharp enough that she's trying to be a supportive and saying, this is your time right now. You need to be here. You don't need to worry about me. And he's like, uh, not having it. And I agree with him. And I find I was I'm actually glad that it looks like mom's going to be staying in this book because what they're dealing with with mom and the daughter and yeah. him is to me such an intriguing part of this story. This is not a cookie cutter book. This is not just another Green Lantern book. This is a John Stewart book. That's what I'm really loving. I'm embracing getting to know where John is at now and just him facing real life and juggling that. It's what I love about Spider Man, right? And I grew up, the best Spider Man stories are about Peter Parker juggling real life. Getting to you know, getting to know his supporting cast, caring about his supporting cast real well. I grew up loving Spider Man for that. This has all of those pieces in there. It's really important to the book. It's it's what's standing out for me. Mom is Mom is a great character in this. I really really like his mom. Yep, Mom Stewart is awesome. I'll you know she goes she's ranking up there now with Ma Kent with me. Mm-hmm. You know character wise because I always love those great Ma Kent moments when she's talking with uh, Clark. You know. You know, she's at Ma Stewart here is having the same kind of reaction and interaction with uh, John. And I think that is something that, you know, when I was first reading John, first getting to know John, none of that even remotely entered my head. I always saw him as, you know, as this war, the warrior architect, how he had yeah. balancing that. Now you've got you're adding the family into that. And I think that is such a really cool development of who John Stewart is. And I love the fact that. Two things came out of this that I really gathered from this. One, like you said, Ma's still going to be around for a while, which I'm very happy with. But two, I loved that she called him out on it, you know, kind of saying, hey, don't you downplay what you've done. You're Mm -hmm. amazing. And she really kind of read him the riot act in a way about, you know, hey, don't downplay, you know, what you've done. You know, he John Stewart has saved the universe multiple times. Yep. You know, he is on the power levels of Superman and Batman. He is, you know, in all in all honesty, a member of the uh, you know, he's one of those true Justice League people in my head. If I'm building a Justice League team, I want Jon Stewart on it. You know, you and, and and in a way it's gonna sound weird, even maybe more than Hal. Because I like John in a team dynamic. Hal is wonderful. You know, and, he, and he, when he's part of the team, he's a powerful Green Lantern. I'm never going to say he's not, but John Stewart's a Green Lantern who works better with people within a dynamic of a team environment. If I'm building my Justice League, my Green Lantern of choice will be John Stewart over Hal, just because of that factor behind him. Now, if I'm building a hit squad and I'm building a, a team to just go in and beat the heck out of people, I'm throwing Guy Gardner in there instead of John, you know, just because of Guy. But you know, if I want a solid superhero franchise team. He's my go-to. And I love the fact that his mom is recognizing that. And I love the fact that, again, as we're dealing with, you know, Steele and Jon Stewart together, I'm like, this is a perfect combination. I so want to see him there. I so want to see these two working together. Because, you know, again, this is a these two have a great combo. You know, because they're both the creators. They're both the inventors. They both have the minds, you know, that, you know, it's not just about the physical power that these two can do. It's about the mental game. 
you know, and you add to it, John, you know, I've always loved the fact, he, you know, he's a Marine sniper. There's a difference between being a Marine and a Marine sniper. You know, the sniper looks at things differently. The sniper, you know, has different skill levels. You know, and that's something that, you know, for me, I love about, you know, John Stewart's groove and how he plays this out. The Steelworks miniseries is excellent, by the way, if you haven't read it. It's something I recommend seeking out and reading and enjoying. One of the things that I'm really liking about this Dawn of DC is the miniseries all have a purpose to fleshing out the universe. And we're seeing it here with the fact that we've got, you know, now we've got Steel entering into this story. And this is now another vehicle. We, we've seen this with Mr. Terrific, right, with The Flash. I'm glad to see this with Steel here. Steelworks was really well crafted, and and what they're doing and their whole methodology and and why this why we should even care about this facility was well crafted in that miniseries. I love that it's intersecting right here, and John Stewart being on this is a perfect place for him because it it totally fits everything we've known about John Stewart. But it has a little bit of a different twist, a little bit of a different flavor than what we've seen out of John before. And I like that. I like that this feels like advancement, evolution, growth um, in so many levels for this character. And John Stewart as a character deserves this, right? This is a Green Lantern who, believe me, I, I said I'm a Hal guy, but what I totally recognize is John Stewart as a character, if you look at the animated series, People such as yourself who've, you know, Mosaic and things like that, um, depending on when you jumped into comics, Jon Stewart is your Green Lantern. And that is so cool that they're recognizing that. Um, the animated series in particular, though, has has created a legion of fans that really their entry point into DC was that Justice League animated series, where Jon was handled so well. And I feel like this version of Jon Stewart that we're getting right here is representative of the best of him in comics and the best of him in media. And and that's where it's really, really working for me. So th- it, it's something that's out there that I think is really strong. Uh, but to me, with Dawn of DC, they've been doing like this mixture of ongoings and miniseries. And if you want me to buy into miniseries, you've got to show me how it impacts the larger universe. Make me feel like that experience was something that... I like the continuity. I like continuing on with the stories. I'm okay with changing continuity and stuff like that. I mean, I, and, and if sometimes you forget to explain something along the way or haven't quite gotten to it yet, I'm good enough that I can, you know, fill in the blanks in my own head and, and, and do all that. But I, I will say I am somebody who likes continuity to the point where I will fill in the blanks if you don't because I just need that. Um, and I'm not alone in that. I know people are nodding that's listening along going, hey, yeah, I prefer it when they do it through story, but I've got to connect these pieces together. Or it's got to fit together somehow. So I, I appreciate stories that even if it's an overarching story that takes like any continuity errors and kind of wipes them away by saying, hey, it was this thing. It was this machine. It was this wave. It was this character that caused all of that crazy continuity nonsense. I appreciate those type of things. In this, I love that the continuity right now is a well-crafted year of this Dawn of DC rollout where we have miniseries that make sense. Miniseries that are, are fleshing out a much larger universe that the toys that are being crafted in that miniseries play out elsewhere. This Steelworks thing, I want to work at Steelworks. That is one of the cool things about this. I'm playing the Spider-Man 2 game right now on PS5 that just came out. And one of the cool things in there, there is this um, facility. And I, I'm going to say this to be spoiler-free for people that are maybe just getting into it and haven't a chance to play it yet. There is this wonderful facility that is in it that Peter is exploring. And um, and key there is Peter is exploring it. It's not an action moment in the game. It is totally this cool wandering through this. It's like Steelworks here. Nice, nice. So, you, you know, the cool part is going from room to room and seeing the things that they're doing and, and touching on screens and stuff like that and just going, it's cool when, when a comic and when a game can create set pieces that it's like, you don't need to be hit throwing bad guys at me right now. As a matter of fact, I don't want you to. I want to see what you did here. Like, this is cool. Um, there's a koi pond that you come up along, and it's really, really cool. Like, the pond is, like, just 
beautiful. It reminds me of the artwork in this. Not It's not the same style, but, you know, where you're, like, marveling at details that have been put in. I really appreciate the details the art team put in this because it set an atmosphere. I wanted to walk through Steelworks. I want to work at Steelworks. You know me, I'm a techie guy. Yeah. You show me the place <laughs> like this, I'm like, I want to work there. Um, it's it actually is one of my one of my plans when I eventually retire from education, which is you know I've got about nine years after this year. Um, I want to go public sector. I'd like to work at a larger facility, and just just to do it. When I see stuff like this, I'm like, yes, this is when I retire and I can. I, I'd like to somehow be a consultant or something like that and work at a work at a place like this in some capacity. Um, just because I just think it'd be cool, right? I mean, and whether I do or not, what comics do really well, they help you dream, right? Yes. Um, and sometimes in a fantastical way, other times in, in a much more close to home, realistic way. And I think this book does just a great job of making me dream. And I like that because it's, it's, it's accessible. That I feel like I'm hanging with John. You and I are both fans of that. I am hanging with John in this book, and he's not—he's not typically my guy. He is not. I tell you, two issues in. If you were to ask me right now, like who's my lantern right now? I'm John. I'm a John guy right now. <laughs> I really like this. I really like this book. Um, and that's that's an important piece when a writer is able to get there and go, "Hey, Sean, you, this is what you want to be th- paying attention to right now." I really like this book. Oh, yeah. And again, it's it's funny. I'm laughing right along with you. you know, I've always been the John guy, but this is one of those those series. And one of the right now we're two issues in only. And I'm already just looking forward to three, four or five. I yeah. want to see where this goes. You know, and again, that's strength of the the team. You know, writing is huge on this with the, the story. But again, it is, as I said before, a full art team, the writing, all of them firing on all cylinders. It's, you know, they're leaving at each issue. They left you going, OK, what happens next? What mm-hmm. happens next? What happens next? Now, all comic books do that. But this one really did in a in a brilliant manner. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, every, you know, most comic books, they're going to have that where, you know, it keeps leading you and leading you along. And then you get the final, the, the final chapter of that story arc. And you're like, oh, that's cool. What's next? Well, this one's doing a brilliant job for me on, come on, what's next? What's next? You know, when issue two came out, I jumped on it right away and read it immediately. You know, and it's, that's something that I know when three comes out, I'm going to do the exact same thing. Because as I said, we've got multiple villains playing out through this. You know, we have the opening sequence with the three lanterns who, well, they, you know, they get their butts handed to them. And then later on, we see what happened to those guys when John and his mom are taking the train back home. And they're having that, again, brilliant discussion about, you know, where mom's telling them, hey, you know, you're just as much hero. And John's like, hey, if you're not willing to move, we're not moving. You know, this is about us. This is about the family staying together. Even though this is John's dream job. He's willing to put that aside for mom. And I love that mom's like, no, you're not going to set set, a, set aside your dreams for me. And this, after that happens, that's when the three corrupted lanterns show up. Yep. And we get, you know, you get this great character moments. You have these great moments. And then, bam, they hit you with some more action. And that, for me, is a brilliant balance on story development and some cool stuff for us to see. Some cool stuff for the artists to do. And you get this great fight sequence with you know, John against the three. Uh, against the three, And I was like, that is, a, again, really cool looking, great balancing on the story, and actually a great way to end the issue off because it leads to the next cliffhanger that's going to you know, build your interest for three. Yeah, which is really, really important is uh, the story keeps going. You get a lot in each story. And, and that's something that's really, really critical here. It's, it's going from a lot of different scenes and establishing a lot of different things that I really, really enjoy. Um, this, is, this is a very, very intriguing story because of, of this particular piece. Um, yeah. I, I really, really enjoy that. The train, when you're seeing uh, Metropolis and what's going on with Superman and, and you get to see... Um, I love seeing the Daily Planet. I love seeing um, so what's the name of the building now? Why am I drawing a blank off of it right now? Where Superman's working with Lex? Supercorp. Supercorp. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I was drawing. A, I was blanking out right there. But seeing that those set pieces there, the train is awesome. Because I liked earlier that we see John. He's helping out already 
just he hasn't taken the job yet and he's already helping out with how to add efficiency to their own ideas for transportation and steelworks you know how they're trying to be more fuel efficient and it was very today very very current in the story with what he's doing and some of it's like you know he's using magnets and using different where you're like okay some of this is you know advanced tech but some of it's also very realistic grounded tech where you can go it's very believable what they're what they're crafting here and that's important where you feel like okay this is happening now this is happening today they're making advancements that are going to impact us now i love how sleek metropolis looks so we got come make things for us where he's looking at that and they're going away in the train you see metropolis in the background it like you want to go there on vacation don't you like and go around that city isn't that sweet Metropolis is definitely the city I would want to visit, even though they've had just as many crazy stuff happen as Gotham, whereas Gotham, I don't want to visit. Metropolis, I definitely want to visit. Metropolis, I want to stay a couple days, uh, walk around with my head in the sky, looking up. Maybe I'll get a chance to see uh, a blue swoosh you know, fly by or something. Yeah. And again, it looks absolutely brilliant. And I love, as I said, love the artwork on this. I love when they show them. You see Super, you see Supercorp there, but also you see Clark and John flying, you know, in the one panel, you know, where you see those two going, you know, and again, that's the kind of stuff that I would want to see when I'm in Metropolis. And again, brilliant usage of these pages to just kind of get us in a lull of a sense of security that oh, this is nice, this is nice, and then boom, <laughs> everything goes crazy. It, you know, it's you think about it like you know when you're watching a good movie where it's got the jump tape or you know or you know where the music starts dun 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 and you're like uh oh something about to happen here you know we had a nice big pop you know with the big kaboom with the karoom and crash and all that kind of stuff going on with them attacking the train yeah brilliant uh, I love the pacing of this I love how they laid this out. Yeah, I do too. It, it's pa- pacing is really a, you're late nailing it. Pacing is really a key, and it's really a key in the sense that when you're building a relationship between characters, before you do the crazy that you do to that train, you've got to have those character moments where we're relaxing together with them, right? They yep. did a great job of having us relax with Mom and with John before all of a sudden you start shaking up where. I see John after this having a conversation with himself. Should mom be here? Should mom be home? Is it better that she's closer to me? Is it better that she's not? Let's talk about the Revenant Queen, right? Yeah. Because at first I'm like, is that an Indigo Lantern? What's going on with this in, in issue one? Because I didn't know who the Revenant Queen was or anything like that. I wasn't like processing. As I started seeing further, I'm like, oh, they're really like advancing a concept here in a way that's really, really scary and creepy. The way that she's like an infection taking over those other lanterns, but burning, the, is it burning them out? Is that what's happening here, Jim? Is Are they getting burnt out by the way that she interacts with them? Is that infection killing them? I think so, yeah. Because you think back, this is the Reverend Queen that dealt with the alternate universe, right. John Stewart. So what her game plan, because we, you know, her game plan is to corrupt this universe is John Stewart, so this universe, John Stewart, can go up against the universe that she's dealt with, is my guess on what her big overall plan is. And that's why she sent, you know, their minions to this this universe to find this John Stewart. You know, and I think that's her big idea, because I love how this John doesn't know who she is, has no idea any of the name, but his alternate version defeated her. You know, so she knows John Stewart's got the power to defeat me. I need to get one who is unaware of who I am to join up, whether he wants to or not. You know, and that is you know a really cool. Again, that's got me thinking on you know on what's going to happen in the future. You know, because again, we see at the end of this issue they infect John, so we're going to have an awesome fight about John fighting off the infection yeah. because he is that good, but. Will he be actually able to fight it off? Are we going to get a John Stewart fight where the other John Stewart versus this John Stewart, where basically we got to root against our John because right now he's uh, infected? Or is John going to be able to fight it off? Is he going to be able to show, hey, no, I'm that I'm that good. I can take you too. And I, there's so many different ways this story can go. I'm really, really excited for it, man. 
Yeah, I am too. It's um, it's something that really, really stands out for me. I'm super excited for this. Um, it's it's a book that I was I was expecting to enjoy. I was not expecting to be as captivated by this. The cliffhanger you mentioned earlier is fantastic. I love the fact that we got John's infected now, and what does that mean? It, 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 I was not expecting it to go there as as qu- at least as quickly as it did, and I really love that it did. Uh, it's it's really a it's a book that's nailing on all cylinders, and I, I just did not expect any of this. It's it's really really an awesome awesome book. Yeah, and that's why you, you know, again always throwing back to the artwork. I loved the look on his face. You know, throughout that final fight sequence, you mm-hmm. know, where he's really just throwing down, he's seeing the blood, and then he looks at his arm, and just that look, the facial expressions throughout this book had been outstanding. I love the look of, uh oh, on his face that they captured. You know, it, this was, again, this was a story that I love the story and I love the artwork along with this. I, you know, this is, this is absolutely, yes, this is a John Stewart book. I'm so looking forward to issue three. Yeah, I am too. It's, it's really, really fantastic and something that, uh, I've just, I've just grown to really, really appreciate how, um, this book's handling things. I'm, I'm, I'm all in on this one. Look at those strange little beetles. They look great neutron. Our next discussion is going to be of Batman Gargoyle of Gotham, book one. Rafael Grandpa is a writer and artist. Matthias Lopez on colors. John Workman on letters. Cover by Rafael Grandpa. Um, variant covers by Jim Lee and Matthias Lopez. Frank Miller and Jock. David Finch. 125 variant cover by Jim Lee, 150 variant cover by Priscilla P E T R A I T E S and Frank Martin, 1 100 variant cover by Paul Pope and Jose Villarubia, uh, 1 250th variant cover by Frank Miller, Batman created of course by Bob Kane with Bill Finger, and apologies for any name butchery at all. Um, very atmospheric book. I own two versions of this book because I went for the noir version and I went for the regular version. I've read both versions and I encourage you, if you really enjoyed this story to do that because, <laughs> um, it's really cool to see this story in black and white and red and to see this story with the full color. Um, I, I don't know that I have a preference over the versions. I just am very glad that both are available to me. This is a, here's where I'm at at this point with stories like this. We've told a lot of stories of very young Batman, right? A lot of stories of very young Batman where Batman's looking to give up Bruce Wayne and wants to totally embrace being Batman and it's going to be an all the time thing. You got to, when you're doing this again, and it amazes me when writers do this. So it's a total compliment to the writing of this particular book. You got to convince me that this is fresh that this is different, that you're telling it from a different layer, a different angle. You're giving me some new villains. You're giving me, like, new. You know, it's got to, like, what are you adding to that mythos? This is totally doing that to the point where I was like, is this our continuity? Is this Elseworlds? I don't know. I don't care. I'm just engaged in this world that's being crafted here. It does everything and checks off everything that I love about great Batman stories that can either be set in continuity or without. One of the things I'm glad DC's doing is they're bringing back the Elseworlds branding. I appreciate that because I would love to know what is Elseworlds and what's not. Because <laughs> yeah. this one, I'm not sure. And I don't care. Don't get me wrong. It's a great story and they've given me all of that. So when I'm immersed in this world, I could care less if this is in continuity or not. It's in continuity at that moment. Of, of this continuity, at least. Um, because this was a page turner. And gorgeous. Oh my gosh. Is this a gorgeous book very this is a cool episode because a lot of really terrific art one work this one in particular because it's black label and because it's crafted to be this kind of top caliber story they had a little i'm clearly they had a little bit more time on this book than you typically get with a monthly and it shows this is a very very atmospheric very very beautiful story where are you at in this one did you um is this your because you and I are different sometimes in art that we like, but this artwork is totally what I look for. Um, where are you at? Okay, well, for me, whenever I see Black Label, 
I always think Elseworld. I, I really don't think continuity, but like you, cool. this very easily could be in continuity. I wouldn't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. You know, because this is, again, this is a great story being told. But on the art style, now here's the thing. Yeah, you and I definitely have different art tastes, mm -hmm. but, you know, with a black label book, I'm all in on a different art style. 100%, especially if it if it does look really cool. And this looks really cool. And like you, I did get both versions of it. And the art style for both, it, it fits and it works. I was like, man, you know, it's awesome. And this style, it's funny. I, part of me in my head kind of thinks um, Crumb. Yeah, Crumb. You know, when oh. I look at this. Now it's not. I'm not saying it's an exact ripoff or a thing like that, no. but that's the art stylish of the book. When I start looking at this, I see what you're you know, saying. There's some. There's clear. There's potentially some influences there, right? And you know, and again, you know, I haven't read a lot of his stuff, so I can't say, oh, I'm an expert on it. No, not by far. I've seen a couple stuff, and that's why mm -hmm. it flags me in. So for me, I'm looking at this complete. You know, again. I look at this as if it is Elseworld, as if it's another story, sure. and it looks cool. So I've got no issue at all with a different look of this. Now, if this was in the regular Bat book, you know, the monthly Bat book, if this was the art style of that, I may have an issue with it. I'll yeah. be honest with you. But because we're looking at this issue, because we're looking at the black label, because we're looking at something that's Elseworld, you know, I don't have a problem with it. You know, this is a limited run. This is, you know, a part, you know, not a, not the monthly. You know, again, I do look at the monthly books a little different. I like more of the traditional, you know, classic comic book art style or the, you know, the classic art with a modern twist to it. Those are my preferable stuff. But sometimes you get the more artsy stuff like we're currently getting in some of the back books that I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah. You know, like detect the look of detectives is is absolutely brilliant. I'm loving that look, you know, for the story they're telling. So for the story they're telling here, because it's a the black label, I'm cool with this. I love I'm, I can sit back and just enjoy uh, the pieces, you know, as it is. It's funny, um, whether it's black label or else worlds, the branding, it both of those brandings tend to lean me. It, it, Legends of Dark Knight did this too. Um, when when that book was at its at its height of of producing quality one of, one of the things that was really great about all, um, or one of the things that's really great about all of that is the fact that when you have an artist and you have a writer or or you know the artist and writer are the same person and they get a chance to go hog wild and really really embrace crafting their world you get stuff like this where you know the story and the art and everything just kind of comes together in this way where it's just a really really pleasing piece um, it, it's it's something I've come to associate with Batman. Um, the idea that there's going to be creators that are out there that are really trying to put their stamp on a take on Batman. A, and it usually pays off for the readers in the way that this one does. I love this book. I love the atmosphere of it. I love the story. I love the villain. Um, and when you craft a villain that is suitably creepy in this story, that... You know, you've got a Batman right now who is feeling his way, right? And and you see there's there's sequences where <laughs> what was that scream? That was him. <laughs> it was Batman that came through. I really enjoyed sequences like that because you put that in contrast of a villain that we've got here that is very, very crafty and very, very creepy and has has lived his whole life kind of embracing and becoming this person this is obsession over this cartoon series and obsession over um, arkham and arkham certain arkham criminal and you know just you know being the only visitor and kind of going in and seeing that this is a villain who um it's it's almost the the pain that this person's crafting is becoming their own like canvas of sorts is it's really really creepy. There is a whole basement devoted towards disposal of these bodies, and I mean, just imagine being like chained up in this shop, and your job is to dispose of dead carcasses uh, that have been put together due to this quote unquote art that is there. It's just it's a creepy, creepy scene. This is something that could easily be the Batman too. 
Oh God! Um, yeah. In the, in the tone of the Robin Pattinson movie that was there, I mean, I just and I, I say that complimenting it in the sense that it feels like because that had more of a creepy feel to it than the other Batman movies. Um, this would be if I I don't know if maybe I'm, if you're seeing that the way that I am on this one, but I, I just I found like this had a, a creep factor to it. I like that Batman can go a lot of different directions. This was the right kind of creepy story at a time where I'm like, okay, this is adding some balance to the other Batman stories that I'm reading. I'm not reading too much that's this level of creepy right now. This is creepy. Yeah. And 100% agree with you. This could really fit in that universe. Because it has, again, I just I completely agree with on the creep factor, everything, and this is fitting that. And one of the things I also love about our villain here is we have people who are making the drugs aren't there of their own free will. Yeah. And this happens in the real world a lot. A lot of the internet scams that are currently going on right now, these are people who are chained to a desk and they are forced to do the, uh, you know, it's, there's some of the romance scams. There's, uh, you know, there's various internet cons and, you know, whatnot that are going on out there. It's, you know, and the people who are doing it, yeah, they're bad because they're doing it, but they, a lot of them don't really have a choice. They're literally shackled to a desk, and they have person over them with a cattle prod. I'm not making that up. They act, they have cattle prods, and they will zap them if they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Now, and you get to a point when you've been physically captured, you know, you're kidnapped, you're 100% detained, you can't get out of there, so they're doing their, this stuff. This is the same kind of stuff. So when I saw these villains doing that with these people, I was like, Oh, that is awesome. Because again, it, well, it's horrific that people, it's happening in the real world. I don't want people to think, I think it's awesome. It is horrific. But it, this writer, again, really pulled in stuff going on in the real world. A lot of times your villains aren't cut and dry. This is the bad guy. You'd think people making drugs, oh, that's got to be a bad guy. No, they've got no choice in the matter. If they don't do it, they die. Or they're beaten, or they're tortured, or cattle rod, or whatever they're using to keep these people in line. They're doing it, and also the other cool stuff that I love: little details like all the all the people who are in shackles are barefoot. You always make your your, your people barefoot because it makes it harder for them to run away. You know, and you know, you're all of them look like they're starved. They're on, you keep them just enough food, just enough water to keep them living. You don't make them comfortable. So again, they're not strong enough to fight back or yeah. run away. So these are little stuff that I noticed on all of this stuff. I was like, oh, that is brilliant. They were you know, they're, again, here's the thing: they're reliant on their captors. Yes. Um, and it's it's uh, the detail in this, the research done for this was something that I really appreciated. I'm with you. The details in this were absolutely brilliant. Oh God, yeah, and, and you know it's it's horrific what's going on, you know. But I love, as you said, the attention to detail, the research done, and then you add into it, you got a really cool Batman story starting to develop here because you know you've got this lad, you're thinking, oh yeah, Batman's going to run in and save the day, and everyone will be okay. Didn't end right for everybody. Didn't end right for anybody. So I love that little twist, you know, because you're thinking, okay, the bat's going to save the day. The bat didn't save the day for these people. You know, they're all dead. You know, and bad guy got away. You know, you're just like, oh, that is awesome. Yeah, and in his early years, I actually really appreciated the costume design, too, for Batman. Um, to your point about it being more of an Elseworld story, I think the costume lent itself to that. It had the right amount of linkage to Batman. I always love, like, this is one I, I admittedly, I want this as a black and white statue. Um, it's They've slowed down on those, and I, I hate it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't have a ton of space for more of them, but I, I still want more of them, because when I see something like this, right, tell me this wouldn't be an awesome Batman black and white statue when you look at this outfit, right? It's just gear, it's geared for that. Um, and that's what that, that whole line was about, a representation of various different takes on, um, on Batman's costume. I, I really love when you look at even the back of the cowl and the cape, there is, um, it's clearly more armored in certain areas, but there is the ability for the neck to turn and up and down, look up and down in the way that it's crafted with multiple 
You know, it's got its yeah. own spine to it. Yeah. Um, I really, really loved the design. It was, again, talking about detail. There is a lot of attention to detail in not only cool a cool look to it, but function. And I really, really like when an artist takes the time to say, oh, what about this part? How about I take care of this thing that we've seen a lot in film in my design and try my best to do it? Uh, the sequence where he walks into the room with the villain who escapes and he's watching the cartoons and the cartoons are playing on Batman's cape. I love that it went black and white there in both versions of it, you know, kind of went yeah. noir there. And we get to see the villain for the first time with the hammer ready to go. Bruce is already dealing with the fact at this point that he is not his, the, He's not able to function fully. He's not getting enough oxygen to the brain. Um, he and and his opponent is toying with him. There is again that artistry of violence that is there. That is something that really, really stood out for me. Bruce is be you know this is a young Bruce who you could see how this would push him to spend more time figuring out. How, how do I operate as Batman? How do I function as Batman so I am better? I'm building a better Batman. And this is one of those stories that makes me understand how, you know, he would he would try to, out of anger, uh, because he didn't account, like, to your point, people died. This did not go well. Uh, the villain got away. That's, it's an interesting sort of piece. What keeps you pushing on? It is that thirst of vengeance that he has, I like these stories with young Bruce. I don't want them now in our modern Bruce. I want to see our modern Bruce continuing to evolve. I do like it when you do Elseworlds stories like this, when you black label stories like this, where you're embracing this. Tell me a little bit more about that. And then fish me to Jim Gordon. Jim <laughs> Gordon. We haven't even talked about that. Jim Gordon was fantastic in this. Yeah. Um, really great handling of Jim Gordon's character in trying to navigate the Batman world. Well, and again, you know, great Batman stories have to have Gotham as a character and have to have Jim Gordon. Yep. So, you know, again, this this book right off the bat made Gotham a character immediately, showing you the seedy underbelly side, the darkness that's happening in there. You add to it that the beautiful this the beautiful chaos of battle that we got in that fight sequence was like Oh, yes. And then, you know, right as the moment where, where Bruce is down, he's calling for Alfred for help. We flip the page and there's Gordon. So right in the very beginning of the book, we got everything we need to make this a great Batman story. And I'm like, yes, a young Jim Gordon, pictures of him and a happy life with his you know, wife there. Everything's sunshiny, but it is Gotham. So it's not exactly sunshiny, <laughs> you know, but absolutely love this. Again, this was... You know, this right here is a brilliant usage of the pacing because you get that moment, that high energy da, 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 action sequence where Batman's fighting. Initially, you're thinking, OK, Batman saves the day. No, Batman didn't. Everybody dies. Batman, Batman gets away. Batman's buried underneath thing, calling to Alfred for help. Not exactly the best thing for Batman. And then you go into Gordon and you're like, OK, here's Gordon. You know, and again, brilliant writing of Gordon. I love this, you know, the way they're handling him. You need to have this kind of stuff in there. I'm like, yes. Yep. Yeah, it's it's, every, it's ev absolutely everything I've wanted from Batman and Gordon. It's it's really really good stuff. Gordon looking at the like that's not what most of us think detective. We should start praying for him to help us this time too. Gordon realizing we're in over our heads. And we need somebody who can help out in these extreme situations. We've got killers that are escalating. You know, Gordon recognizing that we can't do this on our own, um, especially without that department. It's not exactly everybody operating in the same mindset. Yep. <laughs> um, I really loved Gordon, you know, just kind of embracing this idea of Batman's help. Batman's a partner. Bat I want, you know, we want this help. This help can um, really be something for us. It was something that really, really stood out for me as being um, something that was a great addition to this. History um, of the, the, you know, the detective work, when he's trying to find out more about Crytoon, more about what is driving the motivation of this villain. I really love the history of Arkham, how they're digging into, 
you know, uh, using the logs. You know, yes, of course, we'd keep records of who was signing in and out, who kept coming, who was the only one that consistently kept coming to see this to see this uh, Arkham inmate. Uh, it was really, really interesting to see how that all played out. Who bought the rights to the cartoons? And using that as a way to start tracking down, again, the killer in this. Uh, it was. I loved that this whole like classic animation thing wound up leading to a pathway to ca- tracking down and catching the villain in this. It was, it was. I really appreciated that. Oh, God, yeah. And again, it's the young detective... So, again, we're dealing with the young Batman, so you do need to have that combination. Again, what makes a great Batman story? Equal parts uh, combat, equal parts the detective. You know, so we need to have that in here. And, again, but even before when he started doing that, I love this character, Nina, Nia, you know, with her and her movement about... You know, again, it's that Gotham speak up, you know, we've got to protect, you know, you know, hashtag speak up for them, you know, let our voices be heard. That for me, I thought was a really cool interlude yep. in between the Gordon and the Batman moments. Because again, it's bringing Gotham, bringing people outside of the Bat, you know, into the story, making them part of it. You know, you read that, you're like, okay, she's going to play a factor later on in the book. Curious to see where she comes in. Because, again, that is a neat styling. And then you go from that sequence into the bat sequence where, again, you've got Alfred being Alfred, who we've said it every time. There's a good, a cool usage of Alfred, like, I want him back. But just give me a good story bringing him back. But then you go into that whole thing where Bruce is planning on killing himself or killing Bruce Wayne and being Batman full time. You know, that is a neat usage of you know, the story. We've seen it multiple times where people have talked about it and people have talked about it. So I'm really looking forward to seeing if in this universe he actually does it, if he actually gets rid of Bruce Wayne. You know, because he says it's too late, but the story hasn't gone out yet. Right. So technically it's not too late. You know, until it gets printed, you know, until people start mourning and start having the funeral, he hasn't really killed Bruce Wayne. So who knows what's going to happen. And he's, he's thought this he sought this out very well too because of the fact that he already has filled in the blanks for what Bruce Wayne quote unquote would be useful for. Yeah. Um he's already figured out how Alfred can fill that role. It's an interesting sort of piece where this is a young Batman who does not realize who he is. Like he doesn't understand the complete picture of who Batman is, who Bruce Wayne is, and the value of all aspects of his life all aspects of his personality. And it's an interesting sort of piece. I would be sorely disappointed in this story if he does eliminate Bruce Wayne. Um, Just because, and I'm with you though, I don't know where it's going to go. But my reason being, I think it's always intriguing to see a character because we've all been there at various points in time in our lives. Some people longer than others. I've been in stretches like this where you kind of like, you're trying to craft yourself into something that you think you should be instead of who you are. And it becomes an interesting sort of study when you're taking a look at this with Bruce. This has happened since his childhood, right? Pivotal traumatic childhood event. He wants to be anything but Bruce Wayne. He wants to be something more powerful. He wants to be this agent of change. And see, he still sees Bruce Wayne as this child, who this wounded child, who was unable to save his parents. I, I really like that this story should be, hopefully, showing him some of the value of the other aspects of his personality. If it doesn't, and it goes a different route with it, I, this writer can, this writer and this artist, you know, combo, um, can take me wherever he wants to, because I'm really, really gripped by this story. That, and Alfred is a key player in all of that. Alfred taking a look at all this. Alfred not giving up on him. Um, it's something that we saw in Batman Begins, Into the Dark Knight, you know, through that through that cycle of three films, um, explored really well. I love that this is exploring it again from um, fleshing it out in a, in a, a, more, a more advanced way in some areas. Um, I really like this concept um, of exploring this aspect of Bruce's personality. Again, it only works 
when you're dealing with the younger Bruce. Because now what I really want to see in the main continuity is we've got this cool Zuran R story going on right now in, in Batman that at the end of it, you want to see a more well-rounded Bruce Wayne, right? Yeah. Whereas this era, this time frame that we're looking at right now, this is exactly what you should be exploring in Bruce. Because he's getting it wrong. He thinks that the best way to hone Batman is to embrace 24-7 being Batman. Instead of learning who Bruce Wayne is 24-7 so that way he can be effective 24-7. Yes. And I think that's the critical mistake that he's making here. And I really, really like that we can see it as the reader. So I I don't think that's an accident. I think this is one of those things where, will he make the big mistake is where you're going. And I agree with you. I think there's a possibility the story might go there. I don't know. But I love that they're making me think, He's really gone pretty far in crafting this whole thing. What it, what will it take to make him pull the plug at the eleventh hour if he's going to? Yeah, I'm assuming we're not going to get the end by the end of this. We're going to have one of those you know moments where he grows and realizes how important Bruce Wayne is to yep. the role of Batman. I'm assuming that's what's going to happen, but and a word big but there because they may not go that route, and I love that. That is something, that was one of the things, when they first introduced us, I was like, oh, I wonder if they're going to go with that ground. And that was the first thought that, you know, it was like, I, I'm like, no, oh, yeah, yes, nope, I don't know. You know, and I think that for me is something that, you know, that they're doing a brilliant job in crafting these characters and, and giving us. Now, we know who Batman is. We know Alfred. We know Gordon. We know all who all these people are and we're comfortable with them. But again, they're recrafting who these people are. So we're looking at them differently. And I think that is, you know, how do you tell a young Batman story over and over and over again? And you still get people going, this is cool. This is how you do it. You make little tweaks. You make little things on there. You know, you know just who the different people are. Yeah, they still have their heart and soul who Jim Gordon is. But this Gordon's a little different. Alfred's still heart and soul. But what we love about Alfred, yes, but still there's still little tweaks. And same thing on uh, Bruce. You know, we still have the solid bat that we all know and love, but they're giving us a different version of it in a way. And it's in a way that makes us question, how is this going to end? And that is, you know, when I when I have doubt and question how a story is going to end, that makes me when I'm reading it, enjoy it even more. One of the things that when you're crafting a villain, um, it's it's hard in the Batman universe to create a villain that's truly horrifying because we've seen a lot. Right. The idea that this villain is using a tool where it, the villain's picking a spot between two vertebrae. So that way the victim could not move from the neck down, but will remain conscious until their air ran out. So they're a spectator in their own death. Uh, that's yeah. horrifying. I mean, when you re when you read that, even just reading what's being described, they're seeing the pictures of the unknown tool, the hole that it creates. I, the analysis of these two. It's horrifying. That's why I said this could easily be the Batman 2, um, yeah. because the take on the Riddler was so you know horrifying and all of that. Um, I really was, I was watching this going, woo, oh, um, that's, that's a villain. I mean, what kind of twisted mind does that? But it's, again, it's about the artistry of it, right? Um, and I, I put the artistry in quotes because it's just, it's a twisted world that is Gotham. Yes. But there's a sequence during this whole analysis where Batman's standing there and you see the full look of that outfit. I love the design of the boots. I love that, like, there's multiple layers to the outfit. Like, this is a Batman who has crafted, like, armor and protective wear that goes over layers of the bat suit to try and, you know, increase movement while at the same time increase, you know, his ability to take damage when yeah. necessary. Um, it's why he survived. I really like the kind of gothic sort of look to it, if I, for lack yeah. of a better way to put it, um, of this. It just really fits the art style of this book. Uh, it looks scary. It looks imposing. I am a big fan of when you've got him and Jim Gordon in a room and they are talking through evidence. This is where when Jim looks at him as a help, 
I need to buy into that. It's not just Batman coming in and doing things. Where does the trust come from? It comes from dialogue, right? It comes from standing together, talking through things. It comes from not only you valuing the other person, but from that other person valuing you. Bruce values Jim Gordon in these sequences. He is not talking down to him. He's not talking at him. He's talking to him. This is really quality writing if you're going to start you know, establishing for us, how does young Bruce develop a relationship with Jim Gordon? This is how. These two, meeting of the minds right now, really analyzing the evidence, he respects Jim Gordon. It is clear he respects Jim Gordon. Even though he does the vanishing act kind of thing that he always does, it's still in the sequence when there are the multiple pages, multiple panels of these two working together as colleagues. I loved this sequence. Very, very well crafted. Great use of the economics of pages to saying, hey, we got to really flesh out this sequence. It was really well done. Oh, big time. And I completely agree with you. But the thing I love is, you know, when you get a really good page turn. And that's what we got on this. We had this brilliant sequence with Bat and uh, Gordon. You flip the page and we're back to our villain. Yep. And again, that shift in the art style, the way they draw him, the way they create him. He's in the room. And just how creepy it gets when he starts drawing the cartoon on the wall. I was like, oh, oh. This is going to be outstanding. And again, it's the power of the page turn. Because you go from a very bright, and this is where the color version, I uh, I kind of liked this. Because this the, the, these sequences had a really powerful effect when you flip the page. You know, now the black and white art, like you, I've gotten it. And it's hard for me to say, yes, no, which one's better, which one's not. But this sequence right here, this turn, I think the color did a brilliant job oh, with sure. really accentuating just the the shock and awe of this moment and i again i love a good page turn you know where you know that moment like oh this is gonna be good even before i read anything just the look and the feel this is the dun 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 music started kicking in just because you see that you know and again i love this villain this is again this is this isn't the universe but i want this guy to be around man are you crying Son, I can see you don't want to do this. My cry only foreshadows your own. And this reminds me of um, the cult, uh, in the sense that for the longest time, the cult was in continuity, not in continuity. I don't know what you'd call that story. It was the story, though, that made me want to save Jason Todd. Yeah. And it was one of those, it was, again, a prestige format book, which traditionally kind of looked at, I don't know if this is in continuity or not, just a great Batman story, but it was close enough. This is a great example of that, where this villain could, could not appear in continuity. Um, I, and whether this story is in continuity or not, you could still put this villain in continuity, very much so at a certain point in time. But you also want to do that sparingly, right? Because you've created a really cool villain now that you don't want to make mistakes with. Because sometimes that happens where now you've brought this villain from this great story into continuity. They're using the villain a little too much or they didn't really understand the villain that they were using and they screw it up. Um, And it's happened with villains over time. Bane's an example of a villain who I think has had terrific stories since his original introduction and had terrible stories since his introduction um, where... They've kind of gotten off the beaten path with the character. Hush, I think, is another character that has had great stories and stories that have just shown that the character was not really understood. This is a character where I could see you could either use this character really well or make horrible mistakes and lose the magic of this villain because the creep factor is so there. I want Alfred's cake. Yeah. <laughs> Um, um, not Alfred's cake. Uh, well, whatever it was, what, what did Alfred put in the car for Bruce? Was it a, um, no, it was cake, a piece, right? It was cake. It was a piece of cake. Because remember, yeah. Yeah. when he's talking with the widow, right. he has one other, he's like, oh, I missed one more request. It's to get a second piece of cake to take home to Bruce. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what I thought was a really cool, because again, great usage of Alfred here doing something that Bruce could have done yes. as Bruce Wayne. But he's like, no, you do it because I'm not Bruce Wayne anymore. You know, and, you know, again, good usage of that Alfred is a vital piece of the puzzle. So it's furthering the story. Maybe Bruce will kill off Bruce Wayne. Maybe he won't. Maybe he will. 
you know, and I liked how that's doing it. But you know, something that I caught in my art sequence, in my art read through, the, the one page before when Bruce and Alfred are talking, mm-hmm. they modified how he's doing the climbing. And they actually, you can kind of see the pulley structure and the pulley system that he's using oh, to yeah. climb up the side of the building. I was like, oh, that is cool. It's not just counting on him to swing and climb and do stuff that, you know, you kind of like, ah, eh, person really couldn't do it. They're making, they're showing us, yeah, they're giving us more plausible deniability on how he could actually do it, where it's not just pure muscle doing it, but it's, you know, technical, you know, it's a pulley system. It's a, you know. You know, a draw, you know, it's the different stuff that won't require superhuman strength to do it. And I love that little attention. Again, little attention to detail in the artwork in this book. Well, the other piece, too, is that you have to when you're looking at that, you have to go. This is the precursor to potentially a grappling gun. Right. You know, this he doesn't have this yet. He hasn't gotten to the point yet where he's got that type of tech with him. He's he's got to improvise in a very different way. And you're right, it works really well. The other thing, the blind machine. Like, yeah. And I would so be this guy. He's like, I've got my new toy. It's not really ready to go yet, but it is. Yeah. <laughs> He's taking it out of the road. And I would so be this guy. Like, if I had access to this, I'd be like, uh, we had to lock it up. Let's get it out of the road. <laughs> Let's try using this. And I love that aspect of this. Um, it's something, um, it, it's very, I was a big fan of... Um, Obviously, I'm still a big fan of James Bond, um, but I was also a fan of 70s Doctor Who, where they started putting some cars and gadgets and things like that into Doctor Who with John Pertwee. I, I, am, I am still a gadget junkie. Uh, to this day, I'm a gadget junkie. And I love when they got, like, this car looks cool. It also looks functional, right? Because it's rough. You know, it's um, the design of it is rough. Um, it looks like it was crafted like over another vehicle like you know the pieces that it did i like that um it's got a really cool style to it um it looks like it's reinforced and that part is awesome um it's it's everything that you want in a good batman design and it looks like sporty yeah. i'm like okay yeah you gotta you gotta impress like this is a guy who's got a muscle machine underneath that vehicle and it just looks really really bad uh i really really enjoy it um it's oh, yeah. a, a very good and, design and again i do like the fact that he, he does have the solid window because yeah. he needs an armor yep you know, yep. he doesn't have glass and it's interesting hearing him call it the blind machine instead of calling it the batmobile you know, and again, it's a young Batman. Maybe eventually this will get turned into the Batmobile. We'll call it the Batmobile instead of the blind machine. Or maybe he'll keep it blind machine. I don't know. But like you, I was like, oh, that is really cool looking. And again, just, you know, this is a young Batman. And you got to have these things where it's the building blocks where he's still running the prototype where he's not 100% able to work. It doesn't work exactly how he wants it. There's moments when he's like, oops. But you got to love just how he's presenting it. And even when he walks in there and he gets clonked in the head with the anvil, you know, classic cartoon moment of getting hit in the head with an anvil, this book did it. You know, and I absolutely love that. I was like, oh, that is perfect. Yeah, this book's done a lot of that where it's um, just really, really good design choices. And, and it's all story-driven. It's all... It was everything's purposeful. Um, that's something that the attention to detail when you are able to craft something and you can clearly go as a reader, man, there was purpose to this. Uh, that was so, I really, really appreciated that the the forethought that went into this book. Um, it's it's really really impressive. Um, as we keep going on through into the story, and we see uh, the blind machine continue on. There's a sequence on the bridge that. Action sequences in Batman is something that's really, really cool. He, at this point, is driven. This is a villain who beat him. I mean, for it, it's something where he cannot let this... It, 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 there is an ego aspect to it, but there's also a functional aspect to it, too, right? This is Gotham's protector. And 
he didn't protect. And he knows that if he doesn't do something to take down this villain, this is only going to continue. I love that he's driven by how do I keep going after the villain but yet rescuing people who could die? So there's a sequence where the villain does this really cool thing where he's like, I want to see you jump. Because he's recognizing Batman's going to have to make a choice here. Yep. So and, and it's a great, brilliant, I want to see you jump. Jump and maybe survive. He's like basically telling him it's the only way you're going to survive. So the guy jumps. He goes falling. And they have to turn on an automatic drive where this thing is going to now lock on to the villain's vehicle. And hopefully Batman can reconnect with the blind machine. This is a Batman that is getting hurt because he's got to go and rescue. And he, you know, his arm is, you know, he's dislocated his shoulder. He's got to be aware of the fact that I am trying to pull this guy up when I've got a dislocated shoulder. I don't want to do worse damage to myself. I've got to rescue this guy and keep going. The blind machine looks a little bit like reminiscent of the tumbler when you see it zip into this other mode, yeah. which I thought was really, really cool. Um, Cause I love the tumbler. I think the tumbler was a very functional Batmobile too. And seeing him just just destroy this machine in combat. I mean, you know that the this this blind machine is an expensive piece of kit, right? And it is getting beat up in in the battle that's going on there. You know this is gonna be a costly venture that's currently going on. And I loved seeing how that played out pacing wise. Oh god, yeah. And one of the things I love, you know, as you talking about this, the sequence on the bridge, you got to love Batman improvising, but you got to love the villain improvising. Yep. Because, again, this is not just some, you know, dummy. He's a very this is this is very strategic. You know, we're seeing from this guy on both sides of it, even, you know, when he's got the gun to the lady's head. So Bruce picks up the uh, film and holds uh, the, the lighter to it. Going, eh? You shoot her. I burn this. You know, and it was a really cool moment between the two of them, especially because, again, the guy is in Bruce's head. He's like, hey, I've won. I've beaten you twice now. I let you live twice now. And I love the fact that this guy has beaten Bruce twice, you know, and it is really awesome. <laughs> Does the guy know that he's Bruce? I don't know. And, and I'm, I'm not I'm saying it because of the end, because he says, I see a child, a child play. So it could be him understanding the psychology of Batman because he sees elements of himself in Batman. Right. So that's where he's tapping into it. But the interesting part is in the quest, you know, of Bruce going through. I'm not sorry, Bruce. I'm sorry. Jim Gordon going through the evidence. The one name that pops up is Bruce Wayne there. So it's going to be very, very interesting to see what ends up happening on the patient list as we're going through. Who's one of the patients that was there? Bruce Wayne pops up. What is Bruce Wayne's role in this? What I mean, you know, what is what is that pointing to Bruce Wayne going to mean for this story as it goes forward? I love that this is something where whether he likes it or not, he's going to have to face Bruce Wayne. He can't. Yes. He can't ignore Bruce Wayne in this story. It will, the story won't let him. The events won't let him do what he wants to do. He'd be very happy to let him go. Now he can't. He's got to at least address it on some level because you can't kill Bruce Wayne right now if Bruce Wayne is front and center to this particular event. So that's where he's going to run into a conundrum. At the moment. Yeah, he can't kill off Bruce right now. He, you know, and again. In the process of having to use Bruce Wayne to capture this guy or to figure out what the end game is, will that instill a light in saying, yes, Bruce Wayne is needed for this mission? Will he start liking who he is? I don't know. And I, again, that was a really cool way to end this story in with this, does he actually know? Because those are always the great stories. You know, we now in present universe, the Joker knows who Bruce is. knows. He's known the secret. He's known it all along. But before there was that final big reveal that he does know, there was always that question, does he know, does he not know? Gordon's the same way. Does he know, does he not know? You know, you love seeing that. So they're introducing a brand new villain. Within one issue, they're already getting us thinking, does he know or does he not know? I, I don't know. That That's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, and I, I really like that where it's – you don't need to spell it out for me. You've got me teased enough. I think it's more that he recognizes qualities. He recognizes drive and motivation. And he's trying to connect. 
with Batman, or he is connecting with Batman yeah. in a certain way. Um, he's using the psychology against him. I, I just really loved everything about this book. It was this is this is a clever, clever story. Oh, big time. Yeah, I, I, it's it's funny how we can continue doing these amazing Batman stories where you get this this just great talent that just have great ideas on how to peel another layer of the onion that is Batman. And um, this one really, really did a good job. Very atmospheric. Um, this was it's 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 nice for you know we've had a little bit of a hiatus here. It's nice to come back and be able to talk about. Some unique stories right now because I, both books. It's funny. There's there's some synergy between the War, Green Lantern War Journal book and this book in the fact that both were very very atmospheric stories that had a lot of character to them, a lot of character development, a lot of character growth, and I love that kind of stuff. It's it's what I I mean. I'm drawn to comics for that particular piece, and um, it's it's been. Wow, we've had some good months this year. 2023 has been a very, very good year of comics. Yes. Now I can get out of here. Well, I'm leaving on a jet plane. Don't know if I'll be back again. That's right. The sense of whatnot is once again flying out. And of course, where am I going? But to my favorite city of Las Vegas. And the best part is this is an actual work thing. My bosses are sending me to a convention in Las Vegas. Suckers! <laughs> but seriously, I've got Pennyworth right in front of me. Going to jump into that while I'm waiting for my flight. And I'm quite certain I will probably call again later on at another date. Thank you, and have a nice day. <laughs> Bye. Viva Las Vegas! Hello, it is the Sensei once again calling to you from my favorite city in the world, second only to Cleveland, uh, Las Vegas. Um, I actually was a good guy. I went to my conference the way I was supposed to for work. It was actually kind of entertaining and fun. Um, been reading some really cool comics, speaking of entertaining and fun. Uh, no spoilers, but Power Girl, awesome. Uh, Blue Beetle 2, oh, awesome. We got to talk about that one. Uh, Birds of Prey 2, we got to talk about that one. Um, some non DC stuff, been reading a lot of Daredevil, and I got an idea, Sean. Why don't we do a uh, what's a uh, potpourri and whatnot? Um, <laughs> about current uh, DC writers and work they did outside of DC because I really want to talk Daredevil, man. So, bye. I love that you mean pop culture and whatnot. <laughs> okay, now, in my defense. I may have been drinking. <laughs> you were on a plane, weren't you? Oh, it was all no, of that one was from okay. Vegas. And Got it. Like always, if you are gambling, mm -hmm. they give you alcohol for free. And I may have had a lot to drink when I made that call. That's funny. So it's well, Pennyworth. So you're talking. Were you talking the TV series? No, no, the the, book? Uh, the, com the, the comic. comic and. It was funny because I'd read the first issue, but I never got to this any of the remaining ones. Got it. You know, so while I was waiting for my flight, I went through and I read all of Pennyworth. And I'll tell you, that is an outstanding story. Once again, every time we talk Alfred, we're like, I want Alfred back. That story really does did a great job with who Alfred is, why he is who he is, and just you know, it, it was a great backstory on who he uh, is. It's again a great story of Alfred Pennyworth the spy you know, yeah. and those are some great stuff and i i love that series that was brilliant the tv series was fantastic yes i, I it was i still don't understand like how it got canceled um just because it was just so great um so yeah couldn't agree more you got to read um birds of prey and power girl and um so any any comments about power girl or birds of prey other than the fact that they were awesome oh god oh uh, i I don't want to spoil anything until we actually sit down and talk about it. Yeah. But, you know, well, again, this is where we have to bring back things like we're, we've got to jump back to speeding bullets as far yeah. as DC news. But one of the things we've got to bring back into speeding bullets is quick hits of books that we're just not going to get to in full explorations like that. Maybe that's something we'll bring back in our next episode. We'll, we'll take a, a segment to just shout out some books that we're not going to get to on the slate, but we need to talk about. Because um, I think we're both in that place. So let's save it for that. 
Right. Um, and other than let's flip back to what you said about Daredevil, I'd love to do that. It's it's a matter of us finding the time to do yeah. the. I mean, our, we I'd love to do another pop culture and whatnot episode, and we should really try to sneak something in before the end of the year into our schedule, and maybe just um, spotlight something. I, I think trying to do multiple writers and things like that. I think spotlight somebody and then like periodically jump back and spotlight somebody. I love your idea of the theming though of DC writers or DC artists even, um, you know, DC creative that does work elsewhere or has done work elsewhere prior to coming to DC or does it concurrently. Um, the da- I was a writer. Was I right about that? Chip Zdarsky daredevil. Oh stuff? my God. Dude. <laughs> That's good. Here, here's just to let everybody know how good it is. Um, I was able to get the get a lot of it downloaded for free because I've got that unlimited and all that stuff, the access through, um, you know, uh, Amazology, mm-hmm. you know, and it was so good. I wanted to actually own it. Yeah. So I went and I bought it just so I would physically own it and not only be able to get it while it's available, while it's free. You know, so that's how good it was. Then I'm like, I have to physically own this stuff. Yeah, the writing is absolutely terrific on it. And it was before... So that predates his writing Batman. Yeah. And um, I, I remember when I was reading that book, just thinking, this guy would be terrific on Batman. <laughs> and then lo and behold, it happens. And I'm like, woof. Um, just such a, such a terrific book. I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying that one. We'll have to, we'll have to take some time and, and find an opportunity to talk about that. Um, I think it's important on the show to talk about comics outside of DC um, just because of the fact that we're comic fans and, um, you know, it's it's good to acknowledge other stuff that's out there. It's one of the reasons why I always say for anybody who wants to call in on voicemails, you're welcome to shout out not only just DC stuff, but shout out anything across comics because, um, you know, I think one of the things I'd love from this show and, and have always hoped from this show is we don't get to cover everything. But we're trying to point people to things that we think are just worth spotlighting, worth noting, that have been good out there. And hopefully adding, you know, especially if you've got a list where you're kind of like, eh, I don't know, my comic pull list lately has been kind of meh. Um, hopefully we're pointing to some, to some things, you know, a book or two along the way that, you know, change it out a little bit. Try some of these. Um, and that's, that's part of the purpose of the show. But it's good stuff. So your trip was good? Oh, trip was at outstanding. Yeah, mm-hmm. I really did enjoy. I actually did go to my conference, and it was really cool. And here's I'm going to give a warning out to everybody who's listening because this is um, a situation that is currently going on, and a lot of people don't realize this is a setup for a scam. Mm-hmm. If you ever get one of those messages from somebody, and then it's like they're pretending to they they they're actually trying to call somebody else, or they send a message. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, you know, and if you start continuing a conversation with them, that's the beginning of a scam. And they run it multiple different ways. They can do the romance scam where you start, you know, if they see like, hey, this is somebody who's single. This is somebody who's by themselves. I could maybe, you know, work it. And they run the whole romance scam where they try to get money out of you because they start a relationship with you. Or this is the friend scam where you just start talking back and forth. And you're like, hey, yeah, you're cool, you're cool, hey, yeah. And they find out stuff you like, so then they're doing research on it. And these scams, these are six months to a year before they try to get money out of you. you know. And some of it goes where they're like, hey, you know, you know they'll, they'll briefly mention cryptocurrency mm-hmm. and see if you know anything about it. If you know nothing about it, like, you know what, my uncle, does this stuff and we're making he's doing really good on it maybe you should talk to him and now you're going into the whole crypto scam where you're giving them money for fake cryptocurrency and or the romance side where you actually start getting in a relationship with this person over you know texting over the internet even sometimes they do the the images and you'll actually physically see somebody you know and you'll be talking with somebody you know and here's where some of the stuff like the uh, ai is starting to um, really, you know, the bad guys are starting to use the artificial intelligence to really make, you know, the story clearer. Because they're not, you know, if you're if you're a U.S. citizen, if you're, you're primary English, they're not English. They're in another part of the world. Mm-hmm. So they need to have something a little more fluid, and they're starting to use that. So this is a very dangerous scam. It was something that was a really high point uh, in the conference where they're talking about these people. And these are the situations that in this issue, this episode where I was talking about people being chained up and forced to do this stuff. 
these are the kind of people who are doing this. So yeah. you're sitting there chatting with somebody who you think is your friend is really somebody who's shackled to who's shackled to a desk and has got someone sitting over them with a cattle prod. If they don't do what they're supposed to, they're zapping or they'll rotate in people. You think you're talking to one person in reality over the past six months, you've been talking to a dozen different people, you know, depending on what the scenario is. It's these guys, they're organized. They're absolutely horrific human beings. You know, the people who are running this, this is a nasty, nasty situation, but it was something that I'm sitting there watching these conferences going, I didn't realize it was this level of, you know, whenever I got those messages, I just assumed it was a scam. I just didn't answer and I just deleted the message, but I didn't realize just how horrific of a thing it's. We're dealing human trafficking. We're dealing with theft. We're dealing with, you know, identity theft, financial crime stuff. We're dealing with, you know, slavery. We're is modern day slavery exploitation, you know, is what we're seeing with these scams. So if you get one of those little messages where it just seems like it came a random message from somebody, hey, you're going to be there and you reply back. And I think you got the wrong number. And they start up that conversation with you. No, right now you're talking to a congress. You're talking to somebody who's going to try to steal your information, try to steal your money. And that's well, the part that's becoming really, really creepy at this point is they start with conversations and continue conversations that you could have with any friend. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's where it's really, really becoming scary. Because, yeah. um, you know, the part is it's becoming hard to have genuine conversations with people where you're trusted. Yeah. And, and this is the long con. So that's one of the things that, you know, if they rush to trying to get money out of you, people will be suspicious. But they get, they'll get develop a six-month to a year relationship before they even try to get money out of you. So that's always the thing. Like, I've known this person for a year now. They're not a crook. Yes, they are. They've been running this scam for a year. They're running it for six months before they try anything. You know, because they're, again, they realize, you know, it, this started off as, you know, the everyone always had the Nigerian prince who sent the email about how they have all this money coming to them. If you just give them a little bit of money to cover the taxes or cover the export fees or something weird, stupid like that, you know, and this is the modern version of it where they go even farther and they meet people through um, the uh, through the dating apps. They'll meet people through various chat rooms, various stuff, or just, again, as I said, just that weird random text from somebody you don't know, and you're being polite saying, oh, I think you have the wrong number. Oh, thanks. Hey, that's really cool of you, man. Most people would just ignore it. Ah, oh, no, I'm doing, I'm fine. And they, they run through this, and they've got these scripts, you know, of how they're going to play this out. If they say this, you say this. If they say that, and it's, it's that kind of organized crime that we're really dealing with. And it was, again, the, the, it was multiple workshops on these guys that I was like, this is some fascinating stuff. Um, this, the level of, you know, of evil that we're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the, the real part that really upsets me. And I, I mess with them when they call at times, cause I, my cell phone number is my father's. So yeah. phone, it's the one I grew up with as a kid. So because it was his home phone, predators will call, me from time to time and they're clearly preying on somebody who's older you know my, my father would have been in his um late 70s you know at this point in time and um you know it just it irritates me because you're you're going after people who are usually on a fixed income um you're manipulating them and trying to take away from their pension from their you know, livelihood where these people are likely living from month to month, but have set themselves up to a point where they can do that comfortably as long as, you know, some big event doesn't happen to them. And lo and behold, um, you got these people that come along and, and they hit you with things that, um, you know, um, are you, uh, the, the worst one is Microsoft. They call and say that they're Microsoft and there's a problem with your computer and they know just enough, just enough to be dangerous. And it's it's really horrible the stuff that they do. Um, I keep them on the phone usually for a good hour when they do that and and really mess with them. I won by the way, Jim. I have won Publishers Clearinghouse now ten times. That's outstanding. Good um, for it's, you. it's really really good. I'm holding out though because what I've found is every time they call, the car keeps getting better. Because there's a, yeah. I didn't know if you knew this. It's not just money, but it's a car. Ooh. And and the quality of the car exponentially improves with 
every phone call where I say that I'm not me. Um, Because they'll call up and say, I'm looking for John Whalen. Well, John was my dad, but it's close enough. So I'll say this is, knowing that this is where this is going, because you can tell from the phone number that it's it's them. Um, They're always calling from uh, the Bahamas. Yeah. Um, So they'll call me up and and tell me that I've won. Then they give the address, and it's not my address, because it's my dad's old address. And I'm like, I'm sorry, this isn't my prize. I don't live there. And they keep, then they switch gears, and they're coming to me, sir. Sir, you are not listening. This is your prize. I said, but it's not. I am i don't live there. I feel bad taking somebody else's money. <laughs> and Wilson keep going on and on. My wife starts laughing hysterically because I will, I'm then completely have flipped the script where I am going on and on about how this is not mine. You can't. It's immoral. I couldn't take that money from somebody else. And they get so frustrated with me that they hang up. Yeah. Which is what I'm, which I'm, which is what I'm ultimately going for. I want to irritate them. Then there's other times where they'll call up and I will just yell at them for preying on. I, I get really mad because they're preying on again the yeah. elderly, and and I'm just I'm really against that because actually some of what we talked about in the John Stewart segment on this show, you know, where you know we've both you know had family members or things like that with various health issues that they gotten older. Um, my grandmother in particular, though, Alzheimer's was, I got to see her go through the various stages of Alzheimer's, you know, the very early stages where she was high functioning straight on through and the emotional frustration and, and how people preyed on her. You know, there was times where she was paying people $200 a cut for her lawn. We ended up catching it. But, you know, again, it's predatory where these are neighborhood, you know, people. And I'm not, not talking kids. These were the adults who were going and cutting her lawn Knowing that something was, you know, she wasn't quite what she used to be. And these were neighbors that were taking $200 a, a, a trick, a, a cut for her. I'm going back in the 80s that were taking $200 a cut from her. You know, so, I mean, it was a decent chunk of change in the 80s. Just really bothersome what people will do and how they'll be predatory. Um, so it's not limited to phone scams. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I'm just really, really against people that uh, will prey on the elderly. It's just really, really wrong. Um, and it's a fear that you have. You know, when you get to that age, you want to retire and be comfortable and be safe. And uh, to know that there's a group of people that are out there really preying directly on them is something that is um, just mind-blowing and just wrong. But I'm glad you went to that conference because it's actually timely who knew that they would be like tie into both? Uh, really, in many ways, tied into both books. <laughs> Great molecules! They're programming the computers for a chain reaction to blow up that atomic pile! I would like to remind everyone about our show voicemail line. It's 1 440 388. 4434 or Dr. Norge on Skype. Ragingbullets at gmail.com is our email address. You prefer to contact us that way. Ragingbullets.com is our show website. It's where I post first updates on what's currently going on with the podcast. Also, I like to post up their upcoming episodes. That way you have ideas of where the show is headed. Uh, obviously, we, we allow a certain amount of artistic license for the fact that if some cool book pops up and we want to really talk about that, that this is about you know being passionate about what we're talking about, we'll throw those in, but um, that, it'll give you an idea of where the podcast is headed. Also gives you a chance, though, if there's something we're not talking about, to let us know or to call in and talk about it. So don't hesitate to call into the show if there's something we're not getting to that you'd like to discuss. Uh, put us on topic and we'd love to uh, hear from you. We have a Facebook group and a uh, wonderful Facebook group com- community that's there. I want to thank everyone that posts there. They post DC news, they post pop culture news, commentary on what's going on in the world of comics, the world of film and pop culture relating to everything that we like. Um, I just it's a safe place to go and chat. Um, I really I go there first for my news. Um, so I really want to thank everyone who continues to post there. We will be on our next episode uh, talking some speeding bullets and getting some of that commentary in. I also want to bring back in our speeding bullets segment, though, a lot of what Jim alluded to in this episode, talking to more some quick hits about books that we just haven't gotten to on the podcast that we've been really enjoying, because I think that's an important part of speeding bullets to bring back in. So we're going to be putting that back into play. We are sponsored, as always, by DCB Service and InStockTrades.com. Mr. Seglin, what is going on over at DCBService.com? 
Neil before Zod. 12 issues, mini maxi series, issue number one, 50% off, $249. Also, Night Terrors hardcover, 50% off, $14.99. Night Terrors Dark Nightmares hardcover, 50% off, $19.99. And Night Terrors Nightmares League hardcover, 50% off, only $19.99. Thank you, DCDS. Over at InStockTrades.com, once again, their deals of the week. Batman 3 Jokers trade paperback, $19.99, regularly 50% off, only $9.99. Teen Titans Go Box Set 2, The Hunger Games, $29.99, regularly 50% off, only $14.99. Thank you, DCB Service and InStockTrades.com for continuing to support our show. Remember the About Us section of our show websites where you can find out how to connect with us on social media and gaming platforms. We love connecting with you. We even added mobile games and things like that along the way. So if there's somewhere you want to connect with us, please feel free to do that. Um, Check it out on our website. Jim, our next episode, we're going to be back and talking about the Gotham War. We're going to talk about the wrap-up of that event and what that looks like and the implications for the Gotham world. So we'll see everyone next week. Bye! All right, you guys. Are you ready to sing your song? I'm sorry, Yeah, let's sing it now. Okay, this should be fun. Now get ready for your cue. Okay, Sean? Okay. Okay, Jim? Jim? Jim! Okay! Raging bullets, time is here. We talk about what we hold dear. Comic books and TV shows. Superheroes and their clothes. Just a league and so much more. I just love Green Lantern Corps. We talk. Okay, fellas, get ready. That was very good, Sean. Naturally. Uh, Jim, you're a little flat there, so be careful. Jim. Jim. Jim! Okay. Excellent job, guys. Let's sing it again. Yeah, let's sing it again. No, no, that's enough. Let's not push it. Push it? What is that? Yeah, what are you talking about? No, I don't... I didn't mean to buy that. I think you're going to try to do it. I think you're going to try to do it. I think you're going to try to do it. I think you're going to try to do it. I think you're going to try to do it.